Morning, everybody. Um, I think uh, one of the most important um, aspects of uh, healthcare today, and even healthcare a long time ago, is documentation and recording. Um, as soon as we move on to care on, it's going to be more difficult or more easier um, to document because of the way that the care on system works. However, it's still um, we we still need to ensure that um, in all circumstances, appropriate documentation and record keeping is maintained, especially when it comes to uh, patient consent or patient permission uh, for the procedure that's given to you. And um, when things do not go as right as you think they should go. So if you've got an irritated patient or if you've got a patient with a pressure sore, or if you've got a patient that's been admitted a few times, it is very important that your documentation is unemotional and factual. Um, when you go to court uh, in a court case and you can't remember what you did because your documentation is poor or your documentation is so poor that they can then have a look at, uh, aren't able to assess what you've done, you're going to come off worse for wear. I know Lazan, you've just completed uh, your legal degree, if I'm not mistaken, and congratulations on that. And uh, I know that you are very passionate about um, correct documentation. And it doesn't really matter whether you can spell or not. However, you should be able to at least write some documentation if you're a healthcare worker. This morning, we've got our own Leon van Roy, who's the former <laughs> program manager at Mill Park Hospital. Um, and she's going to do a presentation and a very practical presentation on documentation and record keeping and what we expect in the uh, trauma division and emergency division. Leon, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, Mandy. Um, thank you for everyone for joining and um, being here on time and early. Um, please, if you have comments or want to share anything, please do, um, especially Lazan, I'm sorry, now we're hammering on you um, because you um, have a legal degree behind your, uh, behind your name. So please stop, interact, make a comment if you want to. Um, and then um, I really hope you can take something away from you. Um, so, as always, um, this is just, this has really become one of my favorite um, sort of characters in my life for the past year. So it's the boy and he have a friend that's a mole and he have another friend that's a fox. And then they became friends with um, a horse. So this guy is basically staying in the UK and once a week, he somewhere go and draw a picture and he leave his book and it's basically more for motivational for, um, for what we've been through. So this one, I actually love quite a lot. So um, do you have any wisdom for today? Asked the boy. Yes, said the mole. What is it? Um, and then the mole replied, don't put it off till tomorrow the cake you could eat today. So whatever you do in your life, don't wait till tomorrow, especially you can apply to documentation and record keeping. Um, don't wait for later, rather make that entry um, before you go home. So anything in your life, if you wanna do something, do it now. You never know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. I'm gonna to play you a video, I'm sure you've all seen it. And I'm gonna take this um, three principles um, of Simon Sinek, and then I'm gonna um, pull it through um, with the presentation. So hopefully this video will play and everyone can hear. Call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. 
That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organization, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients to do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer phone. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what? you do people buy why you do it people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it this explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from apple but we're also perfectly comfortable buying an mp3 player from apple or a phone from apple or a dvr from apple but as i said before apple's just a computer company there's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products in fact they tried a few years ago gateway came out with flat screen tvs they're eminently qualified to make flat screen tvs they've been making some flat screen monitors for years nobody bought one And Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and you say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you. Those aren't the other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody, how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you or more importantly, be loyal? Okay. So this video, really, I'm going to take the three principles and just pull it through. So I quickly want you to do an exercise, even if you sit next to um, one of your colleagues or um, even if you are alone in a room, quickly think back of what did you had for supper on the 10th May 2021? Anyone wants to comment? Anyone have any idea what you had for supper on the 10th May of 2021? I don't remember. Okay. Can one of your staff members maybe remember? 
Okay, so all this thought, if you if you can maybe have a slight idea what you had for supper, what did you do for that day, but but most importantly, what did you have for supper? Okay, so um, the three things that we're going to basically look at is why do you need to do um, documentation? How do you how do we document? And then what do we document? So it's really going to be. Um, if you want to interact, if you want to shape um, something, you're more than welcome. So why do you guys think it's the, what is the most important thing? Why do we need to do documentation and good record, record keeping? Salama, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> um, sure. OK, I'll give it a go. So um, I would think that whatever has been done has been documented. So this is basically um, evidence that um, whatever you've done has been documented and it's been documented. If it's documented correctly, um, exactly what you've done, then um, it's just a reflection of an evidence of what you have done for your patient or whatever um, documentation it is. Perfect. Thank you. And then why, why is it important? What, what, why do we need to do it? Is it just that we can make up some time in our nursing day or um, that we can no, file and have... No, yes. for, uh, say from a nursing aspect is that, um, say, for example, you're working in a team, um, obviously you've documented and then, you know, when it, your, the next uh, party comes, they can see that whatever uh, has been prescribed has been done. The documentation is there, number one. And then number two, from a legal standpoint, um, whatever you have done for the patient has been documented. Hence the reason why they say not documented, not done. Perfect. Well so done. Twofold. Yeah, Perfect. Lazan, is there anything that you want to add from a from a more legal type of aspect? Lazan quickly had to run out to uh, speak to the matron. This is Beatrice speaking. Hi, Beatrice, can I put you on the spot? Do you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> from a legal standpoint, I would think that you need to document um, uh, according to legal um, compliance rules, you need to document to protect yourself and your patient, to ensure that you've got, um, that all the evidence are factual and reflected in your note keeping. Perfect, thank you, well done. Anyone else that want to add anything here? So it basically also comes down to, we need to cover ourselves. So we also need to cover what we've done and the way we've done it. And it, it comes back to why did we choose nursing? We, we choose nursing, hopefully, because we care for that patient and we're passionate about caring. So it comes down to we cover ourselves in order the way we cared for our patient. But if in case, in a few years' time or in a month's time, if a patient have a complaint, then we at least have documented everything and it's very factual, as Mandy has said in the beginning. Um, so, and I think it really fits into the nursing process. So I know this is a very boring slide and we um, hate this, but it actually fits in nicely. And if we can follow the nursing process, um, then I think we can cover ourselves quite good. So the first step in our nursing process is assess. So you basically gather information about the patient's pro, um, condition. So that can include your vital signs, how the patient is looking, what do you see? So all the, all the information that you can basically can get um, about your patient. And then what do you do with that information? You're basically making a diagnosis. So out of if you have a very good history taking, you can be able to at least five to 10 differential diagnosis. So if you have a patient that you admit with abdominal pain, you can at least after history taking, write down five possible di differential diagnosis um, by just assessing a patient very well and very thoroughly. Then after you have sort of have a diagnosis, you need to have a plan. So you need to have a plan of what, what is your plan for your patient? What is going to be your nursing um, actions after you have diagnosed your patient's condition? And then if you have a plan, you need to implement it. So either if your patient is short of breath or you're going to put him in a semi phallus position or, you start, or you're going to start having giving him some oxygen. Um, so you need to implement whatever you have planned for your patient. 
And then the last step and the most important one is you need to evaluate. So you need to evaluate, is your patient condition being improving? Is whatever you have done, um, what is your outcome? And do you need to reassess? So it's a whole circle. And that is especially um, important in the emergency department. Um, and that's why we do that hourly um, um, rounding. So you need to visit your patient every hour. You need to make sure your patient um, is being communicated to you of what's going on. So this whole nursing process is basically, you do it every hour. So even if you don't know it, I think we do it um, in, in, our, in our unconsciousness that we actually don't, we don't know we do it, but we actually do it. So if you can stick to this five steps, you will always be able to cover yourself very nicely. Then if we move over to liability, and I think that's where um, we actually don't have that much um, knowledge and um, we will get the lady that Ilza have organized last week again to talk to us. But we all liable. So we need to, we need to write down whatever we, we have done. And that's also, if a patient turn around and they're unhappy, that, that we can go back and we can um, basically give them proof that everything has been done as, as expected. So if we look at, this is just a little bit of background and something that we sometimes forget. So if we look at areas and acts and emissions, um, it's basically, let's take a patient that's in your ED, that's maybe a little bit confused, um, an elderly lady. So this is where we need to anticipate what can go wrong. So what can go wrong if you have an elderly lady? So she can maybe fall out of the bed, so we need to identify our risks. So do we have a safe environment? Do we, is our ED safe for our patients? And I think that's one of the topics that Mandy drives quite well is the safety of the patient. So if you think back and if you walk out of here now and you walk through ED, do you really with all honesty can say that you have a very safe environment that you can put your patient and you have a safe environment um, the patient won't fall out of a bed, you will um, put up cot, cot sides. So it's all very back to basic nursing. And if your sharp containers on the right level, um, it's all your plugs um, plugged into the right um, plugs. So it's all about safety in, in your ED environment. Um, and therefore we have policies and procedures. So um, we've revisited all the policies and procedures last year. Um, and I know it's the email that, that lands in your inbox and you're like, oh, another policy and procedure. But the reason for that is, and that's where the why comes in, is to protect you and to cover you, but also to protect the patient, that we can provide the patient optimal, safe environment. So I think it's a little bit of a mindset that we need to do um, to know our policies and to know our procedures in order to um, make sure we have a safe environment for our patients and for our staff. And then how often do we end up writing incident reports and we're actually like, oh, that's another thing that I need to do, but I hate doing. And that's very important because it doesn't form part of your nursing notes, but it's part of the hospital. So if anyone can want to volunteer, um, what, what, what is the main purpose of the incident report? What do we need to pull out of the incident report? I can't even see all the participants to pick one. So Lama, do you want to give it a go again? I'm sorry, now I'm on N1 City's front door. So basically what comes out of incident reports is quality improvement plan. So if an incident happened in your ED, let's say a patient have fallen out of the bed, then we need to write a quality improvement plan. So the whole idea of incident reports is to improve the quality. So we have identified a problem, now we need to um, investigate the problem and now we need to plan and we need to implement that it doesn't happen again. So that's the main purpose of an incident report is to form a quality improvement plan out of it. And then lastly, what's most important is you need to keep on monitoring your patients. So that's where your hourly round comes in. And that's where we need to put our cell phones away and we need to interact with our patients that we can have a 
establish a very good relationship with our patient, but also to monitor and to anticipate if the patient's condition change. And that's one of the things that happens in the ED. You have a patient that's been too harsh green, and then in an hour or two hours time, anything can happen. But we need to create a safe environment for our patient. We need to anticipate if that patient's condition is going to deteriorate. Um, yes, just a short video about the safety, um, just to conclude patient safety. Meet Dan and Maria. Dan needs to go to the hospital for a scheduled surgery. Dan and Maria aren't concerned because hospitals are safe places, right? Unfortunately, not always. Hospitals are busy, complex places where many very talented and dedicated people do remarkable work and save lives every day. In hospitals with strong leadership and teams that work together, patient safety is a top priority. Strong teams reduce infection rates, put checks in place to prevent mistakes, and create strong lines of communication between hospital staff and patients and families. All people make mistakes. But when there's a good team in place, they can look out for each other. But some hospitals don't have teams that work well together or good leadership. When one person makes a mistake, there isn't a good team ready to catch that mistake and the patient suffers. Communication breaks down and patients get harmed. Patients experience dangerous complications, recovery is slower, and some patients even die unnecessarily. Let's take a look at two of the most common harms patients face. These harms are mistakes with medicine and infections that could be prevented. More than 1 million times a year, patients in the US are given the wrong medication or the wrong dose of a medication while in the hospital. Even the best doctor or nurse can make a tiny error with really big consequences. And every year, one out of every 25 patients develops an infection while in the hospital, an infection that didn't have to happen. The most shocking side of the hospital safety problem is that as many as 440,000 people die each and every year because of hospital safety problems. That's like the entire population of Miami dying unnecessarily. While many hospitals are good at keeping their patients safe, some hospitals aren't. Some hospitals have hidden dangers you should know about. The hospital safety score grades hospitals on how safe they are for patients so you can protect yourself and your loved ones. Learn how your hospital scores on safety at W. And so this is just a short video, just to um, basically put everything together about the safety. So we will touch on that now. So the next one is, so now we know why we need to document. It's the legal aspects and to cover yourself and also to create a safe environment for your patient. Now the next one is how do you document? So in the ED, it's quite nice because we have quite a lot of mnemonics that we can use. So we all know primary and secondary survey and head to toe assessment. So the very nice one, even, and I'm sure if, if all of us know, know this, is the level of consciousness. So is your patient alert, verbal, painful, or unresponsive? So this is a, a very nice and it's part of your triage that that actually, if you record this, then you already have covered yourself of the level of consciousness. And do you do you have exercise with your staff that they actually do know the scores of your GCS? So is everyone quite comfortable to rate the patient's GCS? And if they're not, maybe make a small mnemonic on your nursing table. Um, and it's even in our nursing notes as well, that everyone is more comfortable um, with GCS because that's quite, if, it, if you go to court, this is quite a, a big one on GCS and GCS can tell you quite a lot of if there's any reversible causes and what's wrong with your patient as well and how you can treat your patient. Then this is a very easy one. I'm sure all of us um, in the middle of the night can say this out of your head. So. Um, this is a, yeah, so I think we, we, we be fortunate in the environment we work. Um, you need to fix your airway, and if your airway is not fixed, you cannot go to breathing or circulation or your GCS. So make sure that you follow your principles, um, and with our P1 documents, it's actually so nice and so easy. Especially if we go over to Keron, it's really you just tick, 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 and you insert your, um, your vital signs. So make sure that 
that you do proper documentation of your airway. And if you have done, if, if, if your airway is not open and patent, what have you done? So make sure you document if um, you have done any positioning, if you're going to intubate your patient. Um, and the same with breathing. That comes back to look, listen, and feel. So what do you see? What do you hear? And what do you feel? So make sure that you um, document this properly and then you have done a proper assessment. Um, this is just also just basic history that we all know and it's on top of our um, nursing forms is um, this is actually so nice to do if you follow your sample history, then you have a proper history and it's your first step in your nursing process. Um, so what is your patient's main complaint? So why, why did the patient decide to come to the hospital? Then allergies is quite important. Um, if you refer back to your safe environment to make sure you don't administer any medication that the patient is allergic to. And then medications. What medications is the patient actually taking? And maybe ask the patient to bring a list with, especially your geriatric patients, that they bring a list with because they can have quite a long list. And most of the time they will ask, they will tell you no, rather ask my my wife or my husband, I don't know what I'm taking. So that's quite important to, to encourage them to bring a, a list that you make sure you have proper recording. Medical history is also about the previous um, operations, um, what other medical history they have, and that will also make your picture of proper history taking um, more sufficient. Last oral intake is also quite important, especially if your patient needs to go to theater. Um, and then events, but what, what made or what happened that your patient is in your ED? Um, there was at one stage a doctor that I'm working with and he always took a chair and he, he went and sat next to the patient. So instead of um, just go through everything, he took five minutes or seven minutes and he will pull up a chair, go sit next to his patient. Um, yeah, our level, that's, that's the same. And he will, and he will say to his, his patient, tell me your story. Um, instead of rushing all those questions, the patients actually, and it's actually studies have been done. If you sit next to your patient and you might, you might may think that if you pull up a chair, this patient is going to keep you occupied for five or 10 or 20 minutes, but it's not the case. If you're going to give them a chance to give their story, it's going to take actually less time um, than you running through all your all your um, questions. So give it a try if you are not that busy today and you have one of your patients pull up a chair, go ask them um, while you're doing history taking, what is their story? And I'm, I can almost be certain that you will be able to get all the answers um, to make a proper proper documentation of the patient. And please let us know. So pass it on the group if you have feedback and you have done it. Then this is just the overview is um, if you have a patient with um, neurovascular injuries, it's a good one just to cover all your peers. So obviously, what is your pain score? Um, do you feel a pulse? Is the patient pale? Any paresthesia? Can he feel? And paralysis. So this is a very nice mnemonic that you can also print out for your staff that they make sure that they have a proper neurovascular assessment. A neurovascular assessment also needs to be done every 30 minutes to an hour. It depends on the um, priority of your patient. Then this is quite a big one. Uh, medication administration, um, like the video, I've also said that this contributes to patient safety in a, in a safe environment. Um, so you always need to make sure you have the right patient because in the ED it's chaotic. Um, I'm sure all of us sometimes have, you don't know, you grab one medication and you grab another medication and um, at the end of the day you're like, have I done actually the right, right medication for the right patient? So please make sure you have the right patient, the right medication, the right dose, and why are you giving that medication? So if you cannot tell your, your patient why you're giving the medication, then um, you need to either confirm with your colleague or we have micromedics where you can go search um, for the um, medication type and in which class it fell, fell that you can explain to your patient the reason why you're giving that type of medication. Right route, so some of your medications you can give IV and IM, so make sure that you're giving the right medication. And then the right response, so what, 
after if you've given Dromol, obviously you want your patient to have a better pain, pain score. And then you need your um, documents. So always make sure if you um, give medication that you double check it with your um, colleague and that you also have signed your date and your time and your colleague have also co-signed. Because I know, and I'm guilty of it as well, and I've done it more than once, we, um, you quickly sign your medication and you just shuffle that same paper into your colleague's notes and say quickly co-sign. Um, and is that really the right thing to do? So maybe stop and make sure that if you are giving medication that we are doing the right way. So what do you document? So this is just something that I actually have found that's actually quite nice is um, subjective. So that is where you pull up your chair and you actually um, get your patient's story. So that is everything that the patient has said to you. So, sorry. So that's everything. So is so um, you can link it to said or say, so everything that the patient has said. But if you document it, make sure that you either put it in inverted commas or that you say the patient have verbalized that I have abdominal pain or the patient's daughter have verbalized. So make sure that um, if someone else reads it, that they understand it comes from the patient. Then the next one is objective. So that's everything that we do. So that is our vital signs, um, our, what, what we do find in our, what we can basically see. So that's basically the look, listen and feel um, data. Then assessment. So what have you found? So that's your part of your nursing assessment. So um, there's an example of 60% um, accuracy. Yeah, so that's just basically, you interpret what the patient has said and you interpret what you have seen on your vital signs, on your ECG, the pain score, and you basically make an assessment. And then we need to plan. So it doesn't help. We have done subjective data and we have objective data and we have assessed our patient, but what is our plan? So we need to have a plan. So either we're going to call the doctor, we're going to put up an IV salon, we're going to grab an ECG. So I think what we've done very well is we have pathways. So at least with ACS and stroke, we have certain pathways that we can start following. So you have a plan. You must just decide which plan you want to follow. Then just general tips. Um, and this is now more for um, the units that are not on Keon um, yet. So please don't leave any blank spaces. So if you have half a line open, rather draw a line and um, Make sure that no one else can um, come and fill in your space. Don't use tippics or don't scratch it out. Rather take a ruler or uh, something that you can draw a line on um, and make sure that you're ruling that, that entry out that you don't want to. And you need your initial date and time with it. Then state facts. Don't, don't get emotional in your um, nursing notes. Keep to facts. And then no slang or humor. So... Again, we professional, we nurses, um, we healthcare professionals. So um, make sure that you are keeping to being professional. And then appropriate abbreviations. There's so many abbreviations. So just make sure that whatever abbreviation you use are falling into the NetCare um, abbreviation list. And then I think this is everyone. So make sure that after every entry, there's a signature, there's a date, and there's a time. Okay. So then I think this is like, I think we learned this in our first year of nursing. So if it's not documented, it might as well not exist. And that's very true. So if you have, have not written what you have done, then you have not done it. And um, I think one of the other things, we're so busy sometimes in the ED, we will make an entry because we know the doctor is gonna do addressing and doing sutures and we start documenting, but make sure that you're only documented as soon as the procedures is done. So don't work ahead because you never know what might can go wrong. And then communication. So if you're not going to communicate with your staff and if you're not going to communicate with each other and also if you're not going to communicate with your patient, um, then we might as well um, be failing in everything. So communication is quite the essence of human life. So make sure that you're communicating. Make sure that you, in your hourly rounds, you keep your patient up to date of what's happening 
Um, so communication is quite important. Um, the biggest failure in everything that we do in life is we assume that communication have taken place and it have not taken place. So please make sure that you have um, communicate everything to your staff. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my question what I've asked in the beginning. So what did you have for supper? And I'm sure no one of you known that, Mon that 10 May was a Monday. So the point that I want to make is if you cannot even remember what you've had for supper on 10 May, how are you gonna remember what you have done to your patient um, two weeks ago or a year from now? So if you have not documented and you need to go to court and you have not recorded it, then how are you going to defend yourself? So, yeah, SAPA is quite a small thing, um, but we can actually just make sure that we record everything. Even if you need to go back and make a late entry, it is all good, but make sure that you record everything that you have done and see and what the patient has said. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to end again with um, the horse and the boy. <laughs> so who do you think are the strongest? Asked the boy. The soft-hearted and the honest, said the horse. And then the mole with the cake said, the one who can resist cake, said the mole. So basically, I think the horse are the, are the wise ones. So we need to be honest. We need to make sure our record keeping are transparent. Um, and the reason why we are doing this is to create a safe environment um, and to be the best possible um, person and nurse we can be um, in our emergency departments. Cool, any comments, any questions, anything that anyone wants to add? No, thank you, Leon. I've put some comments on the side, uh, just little iterations on nursing documentation. And there is a very nice uh, document by uh, ANA, the Association of Nurses, um, which is a nursing organization on, um, on documentation in nursing or the use of nursing documentation, which perhaps I can send to you and then you can send uh, to everyone. It is copywritten. Um, so don't uh, steal from it. But however, you know, it's American Nursing Association and they always uh, document everything quite nicely, including how they use things. So if you print it, I'm sure that and read it or give copies to your staff. It is a very um, significant documentation on, 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 um, on nursing documentation, got lots of references. And remember the Americans are very litigious. So they will sue you for sneezing in a hospital um, if you're not supposed to sneeze. And so the, the documents are very good around what are your requirements. Remember as a registered nurse with the South African Nursing Council, you also have a responsibility in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in terms of your, your uh, continu continuity of care and uh, your um, responsibility to document and to inform the doctor of any changes in the patient's healthcare condition. And often documentation is, um, is, is there, but nobody bothers to tell anyone or nobody bothers to read anybody else's documentation. So it seems like we put the stuff there just so you can use your pen and then get a new one at the end of the month. But it's very, very important. And even a handover document from a paramedic or a, a physical handover during the paramedic pause when they hand over the EMS pause is very important because you may miss very, very important information. And that information should be transcribed and it should also be uh, discussed in the nursing team. Um, Leon, very good um, presentation. I'll send you the document, which you can send out to everybody else. Um, and I'm sure it'll be good reading. If you don't like reading it, just put it in the loo at the back of the door and everybody can read it. I always put my documents at the back of the loo because there's nothing else to do except to read what's on the back of the door. Unless you want people to relax in the loo, then you don't put it there. We can um, maybe um, use it for our um, journal club next month and our newsletter or something. Absolutely, Leon. You can use no. it for the journal club and the newsletter, 100%. Okay. Um, is there anything else from anybody else? I think Leon did a really, really uh, practical, and that's maybe if you look at Leon's presentation, it's also about documentation. It told you exactly what you need. 
It gave you the history and the story and why it's being presented. So the why, the what, and the how, you knew exactly what her lecture was about. Um, and in the end, it wasn't over, it wasn't um, overbearing and that you didn't have death by PowerPoint. So it was a very, <laughs> very, very, very good presentation. Um, and that's really how your documentation should be. There's no reason to write things that are normal, but there's definitely lots of reasons to write abnormal things. And for me, when I do the assessments of your documentation, when there are complaints and queries, it is often very difficult for me to get an understanding of the story. And often I get told it verbally and I say, well, did you document it? And if it's not documented, don't bother guys. I, I can't defend you if it's not documented. Um, somebody said all my info goes behind the toilet door as well and staff does read and staff to read it there that Salama as long as they don't sign that they've read it Salama well they're still in the loo I'm quite comfortable with that you would want to put the signage list outside next to the end basin yeah I think um, anybody else these sessions are really good Leon I, I appreciate that you put them together and it's also nice to put you on the spot every now and again so that you can do a talk so thank you very I'm much. A, I must be honest, I forgot a little bit about this morning. So that's why I've ended up doing it myself. <laughs> I think it was a very valuable talk and I appreciate it. Are there any questions from anyone? And do you find these sessions valuable? If you do, because you join, there's some that join every time and there's some that don't join. Um, and I think that those of you who do join benefit from this and you need to keep um, attendance registers because when the when the um, points come in for nursing, uh, your nurses all will be very um, uh, uh, positive because you've kept record of their training. So please guys, maintain the record of the training. Otherwise, if there are no other questions, somebody said, thank you, it's very helpful. I don't know who you are, just that you're 5737. Who's 5737? You know, you can change your name. If you click on your name, and you go, there's something there it's that's Kay just... from Olive Kay. Dale. Yeah. Hello, Kay. Hi, Kay. You could, Kay, you, you know, you can change your name, hey? Click on your name and it asks you, and you can change your name there. On the little three dots, I think it is. Somebody who's there, just have a look. You click on the little three dots and it says that you can change your name. Anyway. I mean, Mandy, can I, can I challenge them? Did they pull up a chair? And get the history from their staff and pass on the ED team group if it worked or not worked. I, I don't think they even need to be challenged. Do you remember the picture of Michelle Mon? I don't know if Michelle is on. During COVID, where she was seen in her PPE, sitting next to a patient and holding the patient's hand. And uh, and and I can tell you um, that it it um, or hugging a patient or something with her PPE. It said. It, the story, the picture told the story. So yes, I think that every unit manager who does uh, 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 intentional rounding, as you should be doing as part of the ED practice, should be taking the time to pull up a chair and sit next to a patient today and every day and ensure that your staff do it. Um, and talk to your staff about documentation during your safety huddle in the morning because documentation and communication of one of the most important parts of safety in the ED. They are the important parts of safety and disaster management as well. You'll see from any disaster where there's a discussion about what were the pitfalls of that disaster, it will be around documentation and communication. And communication is documentation and documentation is communication. So try it today, guys. Go and have a safety huddle with everyone as you should be every morning having a safety huddle as to who'll do what um, and who's responsible for what and when COTSAD should be up and you can start with documentation is an important aspect of safety in an emergency department. We don't want to keep you too long. Um, it's already quarter to eight. We should be going till eight. So you're going to get 15 minutes to go and sit next to a patient now. Hey, Leon, what do you say? Yes, but I need to maybe share on the group, Mandy, that ED team group that you that you formed last week. Maybe. Uh, what do you get? Yes, please. You, you, you know, the, oh, that's the, that's the other thing. Yeah. Um, doc, I, I think a lot of you get irritated with all the WhatsApp groups and all the Telegram groups. But the, the group that I formed last week was to actually reach the emergency department staff with whatever you get 
um, during a day in the emergency department. And there's some positive stuff. We're going to start posting a newsletter on there. We're going to start posting important information around maybe documentation. We can go and put some of these comments on that one today. And for you to also share when your staff get a positive uh, a, a, a compliment from uh, patients or whether you've got a compliment for your staff. I think as a national group, we can encourage our staff to be more emergency department centered and person centered if we actually just um, communicate with, with them as a huge team and we can put some competition uh, between them in terms of all of this. So please assist me on that, on that one. Salama or, or Melinda, or Gail, or Parashini, or uh, Lazan, or Marisa, or Annette Otto, Bernice, those whose names I can see, Michael, um, to put stuff on that, um, on that uh, uh, platform to encourage our staff. There's Porsche's on, Jessica's on, Shame you kept picking on Salama, but there are other people on, Elena's on. I'd like to see you um, put some really positive things, and if your staff member gets a positive uh, response or um, your, your scores are up or whatever it may be that we put it on there. It's really an encouragement platform for our staff in the emergency department. Elsie joined a bit late, but anyway, I'll, I'll let her in now. So um, yeah, thank you. We've got a series coming up on um, poisoning um, in the emergency department. Uh, there's some doctors from the provincial, uh, from the emergency medicine department who are gonna do us a series on drugs and poisoning. And that'll be quite interesting for your staff because I think you're faced with that almost on a daily basis. Leon, if there's nothing else, I think we can let people go and enjoy their day at work. Yes, perfect. Have an awesome day and create moments of person-centeredness. Absolutely. Hug a hug, well, hug, hug an elbow of a staff member. Thanks, yes. guys. Be good. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.